All uh, right, good. Okay, so it's uh, 4.40 and um, we're happy to have uh, Valeri with us today who's going to present uh, the, a paper on hedge funds and financial intermediaries. The floor is yours, 20 minutes. Great to have you, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers to, to be part of, to be included in this prestigious conference. Uh, it's very nice, small conference, perfect. Um, okay, so this is joint work with Magnus Dahlquist and Eric Svidrup. And so um, because time is limited, I'll jump right in. Okay, uh, so can you see my slides progressing? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to introduce the topic a little bit. So hedge funds and prime brokers, uh, prime brokers, we the financial intermediaries. So prime brokers are typically large investment banks, right? And here's, here's a picture of some of our favorite prime brokers that are controlling most of the market. Uh, Deutsche Bank is here, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, some Canadian banks, even some of the smaller Swedish banks we have. Um, so these are, these are the prime brokers. And they provide services to the hedge funds, uh, such as clearing settlements. So if you would like to borrow stock to short, they do securities lending, uh, they help with reporting, research, even capital introduction, and most importantly, financing. So here's a graph just to give you a, a perspective. We're going to come back to this, actually. Uh, if you had to think Think about the share of um, aggregate lending or borrowing that the hedge fund does, right? To 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 use leverage, and most of it, or, or over fifty percent of it, is going to come directly from from its prime broker. And some of it will be via repos. Again, a uh, prime broker will help them with that. So most of the funding will come from the prime broker. So how, how may prime brokers affect hedge funds? Okay, So they could affect it in a systematic way, meaning it's the aggregate risk, the aggregate prime broker or financial intermediary uh, movements that are going to impact hedge fund returns eventually. Or it may affect it in a, in a syncretic manner, meaning the individual prime broker may shock its own clients, and then we, we go from there. So we study both. So this is a, just a representation of our data. Uh, we're not going to be using network tools for this. It's not uh, not really and not really useful with uh, with the kind of data we have, but um, it just gives you a bit of a sense of what we have in mind, right? So this is in 2017. We have Morgan Stanley say and um, or Goldman Sachs and its prime bro uh, and its hedge fund clients are connected to it. So when we think of systematic, we think maybe all of these uh, purple boxes being shocked at the same time, and then they would eventually affect hedge funds. When, when we think of uh, idiosyncratic, we think of one of the boxes being shocked and only the clients being affected. So that's kind of um, the general idea. Okay, so the systematic prime broker risk, where does this come from? Why are we studying this? So there's now been a, a push in, in asset pricing to study intermediary asset pricing, uh, work, theoretical work by Hare Krishna Murthy, and now empirical work by Adrian and Al and Hare and Al, showing that shocks to intermediary health uh, I actually priced in the cross section of multiple asset prices, uh, asset classes. Okay, but what about hedge funds? Hedge funds are essentially portfolios of assets, right? Uh, traditional factor models are not particularly good at uh, at explaining the cross section of hedge fund returns. There's many competing factors introduced, but th there's no consensus, right? No formal analysis tr uh, trying intermediary risk in this cross section. So that's one of the first things that we do, right? Um, we spend quite a lot of time in the paper on this just to confirm it, but that's actually more of a confirmation that intermediary risk matters for the cross section. The, the 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 more the more kind of peculiar channel is or, or question is this idea of a causal channel. The, the question is yes, great. They explain the cross section intermediary risk or exposure to this uh, prime broker systematic prime broker risk explains the cross section. But can we really claim that the shocks originate in the prime brokers and then go on to hedge funds and not in reverse? Um, and that's something that we also try to tease out. Okay, so to try to attribute some causality of who comes first, this chicken and the egg story, because there's obviously a lot of simultaneity going on in asset prices. And the last question that we study is the idiosyncratic prime broker shock. That's a little bit uh, more intuitive. So we can imagine a bank, um, 
it, it's suffering from some losses. And then, of course, they have to tighten the financial belts, maybe unwind positions, force hedge funds to unwind position, cut away leverage, and hedge funds may be affected and they may experience losses because of that. So Lehman is kind of a prime example, uh, but we want to see uh, when we want to see more examples of this and see how that um, that plays out uh, to investigate this further. So these are the big the big questions that we look at. Related literature we obviously relate to intermediary asset pricing, hedge fund systematic risk, trying to explain hedge fund returns in general, and the more micro kind of microeconomic studies of hedge funds and prime brokers. I'm not going to mention the exact um, the exact studies. So data is fairly standard. So the only thing that I would like to mention is we have a panel, unbalanced panel of live and dead hedge funds. So we do the normal filters. Uh, everything is, is by the book. Um, the difference between what we do and some of the other studies is that we use Eureka Hedge, which is a, uh, a, a reliable hedge fund database. But we focus on that database primarily because it allows us to track uh, prime broker relationships over time, right? Or so relations over time. Because um, each, each snapshot, if I had to download the data now, they will only tell me what the prime broker is at this point in time. So maybe it's Goldman Sachs. But this hedge fund could have been using Lehman Brothers in 2008. And I don't know that looking at one database. So we have to track these databases and snapshots over different time to make sure that we get the reliable information. Because there is quite a lot of turnover in prime brokers, maybe 4% per year. So we want to make sure that we really know who each hedge fund was using each point in time. So that's really the only trick with the data. Otherwise, it's fairly standard stuff. Okay, so just to give a bit of motivation for those who aren't familiar with the systematic financial intermediary risk, it goes, it comes from Hare Krishnamurti papers and Hare Kale and Manila. And the idea is that there's a wedge between us consumers and our investment decisions. Uh, we, can't, we may not be able to invest directly, et cetera, and we invest through intermediaries. And because of that wedge, because of this friction, intermediary marginal utility also matters for aggregate asset pricing, right? So you can, um, uh, th th this is kind of the standard theory. And so we can think about the intermediary marginal value of wealth being some function of aggregate wealth and this parameter eta, which is going to be the ratio of equity to assets. Basically, we just need to get a feel of when intermediaries are in trouble, when equity over assets is super low, they're not, they're feeling constrained, and, and hence uh, there's going to be a risk premium associated for these states of the world. So that's really the, the fundamentals. So basically shocks to intermediary capital um, are go, uh, should be priced because of this. And that's indeed what, what, what shows up in other asset classes. Okay, so let's take a look at um, who are these financial intermediaries? Who are the prime brokers that are playing the biggest role in the hedge fund sector? So here are the main players, right? Goldman, Morgan, Deutsche. And if you add them all up, you get close to 90%. So the top 10 uh, prime brokers really control most of the business, right? So we, we, we looked at this from different angles. And what we find is about 38 listed prime brokers, I obviously include the smaller ones too, they control about 95% of the business, right? Most of, essentially, every single New York Fed primary dealer, and these are the key intermediaries identified by Hay and Al as being very important for pricing, are also prime brokers. So they're one and the same. So we can't really distinguish between them. These are the big systematic banks. You know, we, we can call them primary dealers. We can call them big prime brokers. It doesn't matter how you call them. They're the important ones. And we can try playing around with different, uh, with different ways of constructing factors out of these, but all the factors are going to look the same pretty much. So for our analysis, we're just going to use the traded factor of Hekel and Manila, which is just the value weighted portfolio of these prime broker returns. And you can, you can use the untraded factor, which is the ratio, uh, or you can use the traded factor. It doesn't matter uh, as long as you capture these main intermediaries. Okay, so the systematic risk uh, uh, results are very, very, very standard, right? So there's no funny business here. First, we uh, run a two-factor model, intermediary risk and just the market risk, CAPM style, and we sort them into portfolios. Portfolio one, low beta, low intermediary beta, portfolio 10, high intermediary beta, and we have a nice spread 
kind of an average returns between high and low, right? We can test that and check if there's alpha, controlling for the eight-factor Fung Shane model, controlling for the global risk adjustment model. Uh, we can try it with non-traded factors. It's there. The spread is definitely preserved. Uh, one result that is worth mentioning, which I think is, is kind of confirming this idea that it's really a small group of financial intermediaries that's important. We can do a placebo test. We can do the same sort, but instead of sorting and using the traded um, the prime broker factor, I exclude all the prime brokers and I just use financial firms in general uh, with the security ID codes you know, that, that are capturing the financial sector. So I throw out Goldman and Deutsche, but I keep the others. And what I get is no spread in that. So it's really these key banks that, that are cre creating it. Yeah. 10. 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're good. Okay, so just to be formally tested all once and for all, we run a Pharma Macbeth and we definitely find a significant price of risk, uh, even with all the standard hedge fund control style, regional fixed effects, you name it, it's there. Okay, so the cross-sectional spread uh, is definitely there. What kind of financial intermediaries are hedge funds? But so now the question is, but wait a second, hedge funds themselves could be categorized as financial intermediaries, right? They, they play around in asset markets, uh, maybe Maybe they even affect asset prices. Well, uh, prior literature doesn't find a direct effect on expected returns. They do find effect on liquidity. Hedge funds do seem to affect liquidity. There's a number of studies kind of confirming that, but not so much on expected returns. But we could still suspect that perhaps hedge funds systematically affect their own prime brokers. So we have a bit of a reverse causality story happening. And, um, and if not, then we may as well want to test if prime brokers really do causally affect uh, hedge funds. And it's not just one of these relationships um, that we have to take uh, as, as, as simultaneous. Uh, so well, that's what we investigate here. So we uh, take a granular instrumental variable approach. This is the GIV approach recently uh, proposed by Gaber and, and Colgen. And the basic idea, um, I won't be able to introduce all the nitty gritty here, but uh, the question that we want to ask, the first question is, imagine that there's a prime broker, let's say Goldman Sachs, and it's going to be affected by, um, by, by financial intermediary risk and market risk and some some other factors, uh, idiosyncratic factors, ATA, or other factors that I didn't include, but it might also be affected by its own clients. And this RS, okay, is the value weighted portfolio of its own clients. And this parameter gamma, we expect maybe is positive if there is this idea that its clients are affecting the performance of the prime broker. But of course, all of these things are happening at the same time, and we cannot just estimate it. Uh, simultaneously, so we have to instrument for, for the client return RS. And how do we do that? Well, this is where the GIV comes from. The instrument for this return RS, the evaluated portfolio of its clients, is going to be based on essentially if we model each hedge fund return as some common variation plus the idiosyncratic variation, the instrument is going to come from a collection of idiosyncratic hedge fund shocks, okay? And that only works and I'm going to quickly show you that only works if we don't have a uniform distribution, if we have fat tail distribution. So there's going to be one or two big hedge funds and we strip away as much as we can of the common variation, leaving just the idiosyncratic shocks of some of these large hedge funds. And then we use that to instrument for this, for this effect, right? And the main identifying assumption is, of course, the shocks that affect the prime brokers are going to be uh, orthogonal to these, to these idiosyncratic hedge fund shocks. So that's, that's that's basically the, the question is, can we, uh, can we test for it? And what we find is uh, the opposite of, of the reverse causality story, really. Uh, it's not statistically significant. There's a lot of noise in the data, but it's, you know, it's consistently negative. So what we find is good news for hedge funds, bad news for prime brokers, and the reverse. There's a lot of anecdotes that I can, show, I can share with you, such as the JP Morgan um, big whale crisis in 2012, when they lost about $5 billion on a CDS trade. And and who won it? It was their clients. The clients were the ones who, who won the $5 billion. JP Morgan is the one who lost it. There's a lot of that kind of over-the-counter trades with between hedge funds and prime brokers. So it actually goes in reverse. So a good news for prime brokers, bad news for hedge funds, and they do not really co-move when it comes to these kind of things. 
So I think we can rule out the, the reverse causality story based on that. I'll, I'll give you some more examples later. So the next question, and this is just to, again, to really nail down our intuition, is just to confirm, okay, we have our normal model where hedge fund, uh, let's say it's a portfolio of hedge funds, is going to be exposed to uh, financial intermediary risk and market risk. Can we really put a causal interpretation on this beta when financial intermediaries crash, do hedge funds crash? And is it really coming from intermediaries to hedge funds? And so we uh, use the GIV approach one more time where we instrument for this RTFI as uh, based on essentially the fact that this RTFI is just a value weighted portfolio of all intermediaries. And so we exploit the shocks, the individual idiosyncratic shocks to one big bank, for example, or the second big bank or the third big bank uh, to try to tease out this, this more causal approach. Again, uh, the distribution of, 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 uh, of sizes of these banks is extremely uh, fat-tailed. So one five. big bank uh, got five. it, one big one big bank shock could affect um, could affect the entire uh, the entire system. So teasing that out, we do find that for the hedge funds, which are the high exposure hedge funds, we do find a positive significant beta, which we interpret as kind of the causal beta. So for those funds that are exposed to financial intermediary risk, indeed a shock coming from that sector will affect them. And for those who are not, well, uh, that shock is not going to affect them. Uh, so that's that's the idea. Just a few uh, a few points here why that could be the case. Number one, hedge funds are not particularly big. Actually, if you look at them uh, historically, they were pretty small. Now it's about four trillion uh, under management. That seems good. But if you look at the prime brokers, they have about thirty trillion dollars in assets. Okay. But of course, hedge funds also borrow a lot. So if you look at the borrowing together, uh, it's about eight trillion. They they control the hedge funds, and it seems impressive. But but if you, if I recall, uh, prime brokers are the ones who gave them that money in the first place, right? So that's why when if the prime brokers needed to pull that funding, they could do so. Uh, hedge funds, on the other hand, are also over collateralized. So they provide a lot of collateral. So prime brokers are protected against hedge funds systematically on average, right? And uh, this is just data coming in from some uh, from call reports where we have for individual banks, how much collateral their clients put up. And hedge funds can put up to six times the collateral required Corporate clients like Disney or Netflix do not put up as much collateral. Sometimes they put up very little. So really hedge funds are treated differently, treated in a very uh, kind of cautious manner on average by these banks. And the kind of funding provided is sometimes on a daily basis or seven day basis. So most of the funding can be pulled just like that. So it, it does make a lot of sense that the shocks go from prime brokers to hedge funds. Results of idiosyncratic risks. So let's get onto that. I think I have three minutes remaining. So so I'll have to I'll have to speed up the basic idea here. Um, this in the first in this regression we take a panel. We have our prime bro. Uh, we have sorry hedge funds on the left hand side, individual returns. Prime brokers, the individual prime brokers on the right hand side, and we see the correlation in a panel. And of course, if you just run it plain and simple, you'll find a significant correlation between prime broker returns and, and hedge fund returns, but they are exposed to common variation. But once we strip out market risk, financial intermediary risk, and market risk that may be country specific, so Deutsche Bank usually has a German hedge fund clients, we don't have any average correlation between hedge funds and they own prime brokers, right? Not the systematic prime broker shock. But that was, of course, on average, what about the large shocks? And here, I think this is um, this, this result I really want to share with you. We examined these large events where the prime brokers really uh, suffered, Lehman being one of them. We also look at Bear, UBS trading loss of the scandal and the JP Morgan loss. I'll, I'll explain Lehman in detail. So uh, obviously Lehman collapsed uh, and what happened to the clients we have a group of Lehman clients in red, and this is the number of clients that were kind of alive and well before the collapse. And the blue are the controlled sample of very similar hedge funds. And then Lehman clients started disappearing at a lot quicker rate than a controlled group, right? After the Lehman collapse. We can translate it to returns, assuming that if you disappear, your return is minus 30%. And that's kind of what it looks like. And then we did the same exercise for the other scandals. So what did we find? So putting that in a panel 
internal regression during these events, right, the clients did not actually seem to have suffered uh, even in the case of Lehman in a statistically significant manner, right? So even Lehman clients did not seem to suffer more during the Lehman event. Well, okay, well, what's going on there? And when we realized is that there's a difference between hedge funds that use a single prime broker and hedge funds that use multiple prime brokers, because that's now becoming more and more common. And when we uh, divide our sample into hedge funds that use single prime broker and multiple prime broker, we do find a very significant negative effect during the Lehman bankruptcy, where everyone who used Lehman as the only prime broker actually did extremely badly. Those hedge funds that used Lehman as one of several prime brokers actually managed to be okay, and they did not have a statistically significant effect. So they managed to diversify away even the worst possible shock. So basically, the main takeaway from this regression is that idiosyncratic effect of prime brokers and hedge funds does not seem to play out in the data. And even with the worst possible outcome, it is you can diversify it or the hedge funds can diversify it by just having multiple prime brokers. I don't have the plot here, but it's in the paper. You can see that since 2008, uh, multiple prime broker relationships are becoming more and more common. Most of the hedge funds that are uh, that you know have multiple prime brokers these days. So hopefully I am on time. Let me just conclude. So systematic financial intermediate risk is important for the cross section. It's also important for the shock propagation. The reverse causality is not really what happens. That's not the concern. The shock comes from prime brokers to hedge fund, not in reverse. When it comes to idiosyncratic, meaning individual prime broker effects, they do not actually affect, uh, well, they can affect the hedge fund clients in extreme situations, but even that hedge funds can mitigate by just having multiple prime brokers. So that's really the, I think, the takeaway message. Uh, thank you for your attention.